I want to go ahead and start off with just a quick agenda for the day. Um, we're going to wrap up with a web demo so that you'll know how to access these uh, QC and sample handling guidelines online. I'm going to be spending most of the time talking specifically about uh, how we've chosen to uh, present the guidelines. I'll touch on the process that we went through to develop the, the guidelines, but first I want to talk just briefly about uh, really why we have the guidelines in the first place. And that all ties into the SWAMP QA program plan. A QA program plan is a, a document template uh, that was developed by EPA Region 9. Uh, the the uh, idea is that programs will adopt this template. They will create a uh, comprehensive QA guidance document using the template, and program participants can then uh, reference that comprehensive document when they have uh, questions regarding QA or QC policies. So as I said, it's a pretty um, uh, prescriptive template. There are 24 chapters. Uh, each of those chapters has its own uh, relatively strict um, requirements as far as what EPA wants us to include. A couple of those 24 chapters are uh, involving quality control, and a couple uh, more of the chapters are involving sample handling. So essentially, EPA is saying to SWAMP, we need you to uh, clearly convey your guidelines uh, so that your program participants know what is expected of them. And so the way we've opted to do that is through a series of uh, tables that contain the guidelines pertaining to QC and sample handling. So I want to talk just a bit about uh, how we went about developing those tables. And we were fortunate in that we had a, a really logical starting point, which was uh, the tables, the guidelines tables that we created uh, in 2008. They uh, basically had the same scope as what we were setting out to do uh, this time around. And because we had those previous tables in hand, we were able to really focus on industry changes that had occurred in the past five years or so. And to do that, we did a lot of document research. Uh, in particular, we spent a lot of time uh, on the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, there had been an amendment a few years back that affected a lot of EPA's uh, preservation and holding time requirements, and we wanted to make sure that our new uh, guidelines reflected those changes. Likewise, uh, we researched uh, various methods and SOPs, journals, uh, other programs and projects, both regulatory and non-regulatory. And then in addition to that document research, um, we're lucky in that SWAMP is a very large program and it has, um, you know, it's represented by uh, folks from a lot of different uh, field. So we have a, a lot of different subject matter experts. And what we found was that as we did our document-based research, we would find conflicting information. So maybe one program that we researched uh, had a certain guideline, but that guideline was uh, contradicted by CFR, let's say. So in those types of situations, it was really great to have uh, these, these focus groups from within the SWAMP community to, uh, to help us sort of hammer out those, those gray areas. So the result of all this was a draft set of uh, guidelines uh, that, uh, that eventually went out to review, or really a few rounds of review uh, from uh, our group from the uh, SWAMP data management team, uh, various lab and field organizations associated with SWAMP. They were very helpful uh, with a lot of the more technical information. Uh, the program's voting body, the SWAMP Roundtable, was involved uh, throughout the process. And again, those focus groups. Uh, so they were involved 
in developing some of the material, but they were also involved in um, confirming the material that came from other sources. So that was a, a bonus. So the resulting tables were approved and then ultimately uploaded. Uh, that was done in a couple batches, actually. One was in uh, late spring and one in late summer. Okay, I want to just take a moment to talk about the overall skeleton or template that we developed to present uh, our swamp-related information. Um, I should point out uh, there are a couple caveats. One is that uh, toxicity testing guidelines and field measurement guidelines we found didn't really lend themselves to this particular format, just based purely on the, on the content that we needed to convey for those categories. So if you go online um, in, in search of guidelines for those categories, don't be surprised if what you're looking at doesn't align exactly with what you see here. And another uh, caveat uh, relates to this third table that we see here. And, and by the way, if you can't see the, the fine print in the screen capture, don't worry, we're, we're mainly uh, sort of dealing with the forest here, and then we'll, we'll deal with trees in the coming slides. But anyway, you'll notice this third table. Uh, we've been talking about QC and sample handling. Um, in addition to those, there's this corrective action table. Uh, I'm going to be sort of de-emphasizing that today because um, it's really meant more as, a, as advice to uh, project folks, lab folks, field folks, um, that they can reference in response to certain uh, analytical failures, analytical headaches. Um, it's essentially a troubleshooting tool intended for them. But because it doesn't include any um, bona fide swamp requirements, uh, we're going to de-emphasize it in favor of the QC and sample handling tables. So I'm going to really be spending the rest of the talk going going down this list on the right, just uh, letting you all know um, what's involved in each of these components. So let's start at the top with the category and matrix. Um, this this is a fairly uh, self-explanatory component. Um, one thing worth pointing out, though, is that um, there are many analytical categories in SWAMP and uh, potentially multiple matrices involved with each of those categories. And the way we've uh, laid things out is that these category matrix combinations are going to be, uh, e each combination is going to correspond to one file that we have online. So in other words, this is how we've uh, sort, of, sort of compartmentalized our um, our guidelines so that we don't just wind up with one massive file that contains all of the information. Typically people, when they want information, they want it that relates to uh, these categories and these specific matrices anyway. So. Okay, so that's great. We have all these categories, but it's not necessarily practical in that we don't know at this point what analytes and parameters fall within each category. Um, this is particularly relevant in that uh, different programs, methods, um, regulators are going to group analytes and parameters differently, or they may group them the same but just have different names for those groups. So for those reasons, it's good to confirm that the way SWAMP is grouping our elements uh, aligns with what you're visualizing. So an example would be, uh, let's take the category nutrients and the matrix water. So let's say your study involves orthophosphate, and historically you, you associate that with nutrients. Well, so the way to confirm that uh, SWAMP aligns with you is uh, at the top of the, uh, the file that contains the nutrients and water guidelines, there is a direct link uh, to the information you see here, and that's going to give you a laundry list of the 
analytes or parameters in the category you've selected. If you're familiar with uh, Swamp Lookup lists, this this format will will seem familiar to you. And I should also point out that uh, Excel icon. If you click on that, you get an Excel sheet, a live Excel sheet that contains the information that you're looking at here. And so that may come in handy. Uh, maybe you want to create your own spreadsheet and that requires an analyte list. Or maybe you want to paste this information into an SOP or a QAPP or a lab manual or, or who knows. Um, so that's a good option to have as well. Okay, continuing down the line. Uh, if you go through the tables, um, they contain QA information and analytical information. Uh, both of those categories are sort of notorious for having lots of jargon. And so we wanted to provide a couple tools to help you uh, decipher any jargon that you may see in the tables. So for example, uh, you may go through and you may see the term MSD. And so uh, you are directly linked now to a list of abbreviations and acronyms where you will find out that MSD means matrix spike duplicate. Now of course you might not know what a matrix spike duplicate is, so that's why uh, we also have you linked to uh, Swamp's glossary as well. The hope is that uh, between those two tools, um, that everything on the tables will, will make sense to you. And that sort of covers the, the supporting information that you'll find in each of the online files. So now I want to go ahead and talk about uh, the tables themselves. And again, don't worry if you can't see the fine print on the left. Um, the QC tables contain three columns, each devoted to sort of a specific aspect of our guidelines. So the first is just purely what type of QC sample are we talking about? What, what types of QC samples am I responsible for running? So this is things like uh, various types of duplicates, various types of blanks, uh, surrogates, calibration, verifications, and on and on and on. There are also guidelines about the frequency with which you need to run those various types of QC samples. Do I need to run one? Do I need to run 10? How often? And then once you know what you need to run and how often you need to run it, the question is, well, does it matter what result I get? And of course it matters. And so uh, EPA uses the term uh, measurement quality objective that basically these are uh, control limits or performance criteria. Uh, as with m most things, different entities are going to call them different things. But the bottom line is that those are sort of the three uh, topics addressed by the QC tables. So we saw earlier that sort of skeleton that we used. Um, this is what a populated QC table would look like. And this is um, just a, a snippet of one. OK, let's do the same drill, this time with uh, the sample handling table. So this is uh, your content. I should point out uh, right away with the sample handling tables, these are a mixture of recommended content and required content. And it really, it's just the holding times uh, that are required. But I think that's worth pointing out uh, so that you are able to differentiate the two. In general, the quality control tables are uh, required in their entirety. So, so don't be caught off guard by that. One of the reasons is that these two recommended um, uh, items we have are pretty heavily tied into uh, the chosen analytical method. So uh, just some quick examples. Recommended container is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the preservations 
um, you know, can range uh, anything from chemical preservation to, uh, uh, you know, freezing, refrigeration, darkness, uh, things like that. So here's a, uh, well, a part of a populated sample handling table, just so you know how all that information comes together. And again, this, this exact combination of, of tables exists for all of those category matrix combinations we saw a few slides ago, and I will, uh, I will uh, give you an example of that here. So that takes care of really the content of the tables, so we know uh, why they came to be, how they came to be. Um, so now let's just uh, finish up with uh, where this information is located online. So I'm going to use as, as my starting line the State Board Swamp site. If you are on the the main State Board page, if you select Swamp uh, from the list of programs, you will wind up here. Once you're here, there's a Tools tab, and on the Tools tab, there's a QA section. And in that section is the link you want, which is appropriately enough called uh, QC and Sample Handling Guidelines. And when you click here, is when you're going to see that um, really what, what acts as a table of contents. Um, this is your list of uh, the category matrix combinations. I believe there are 21 here. If you click on any one of these, you're going to get uh, that series of tables and supporting tools that, that I was just talking about. And there you go. So that's pretty much it. We've come full circle there. I'm going to leave this slide up. This is uh, if you need to contact me uh, regarding anything you saw in this talk or anything uh, Swamp QA related. There's also uh, plenty of time now for questions if you have them. I got a question. On holding time, you said required holding time. Now. It when you look at when I look at that, it sounds like I have to maintain it for that long before I analyze it. So shouldn't that be maximum holding time? And yeah, that is correct. Yeah, that was uh, that was implied. But yes, to uh, to clarify, that's correct. And the other question I have in regard to the required holding time, it also seems I conclude that if I analyze a sample in a week, I still got to keep it in the lab for that amount of time. So I think you ought to change the, the, that to maximum holding time. Okay, that's a, that's a good suggestion. We um, obviously these are already uploaded, but next time uh, we are uh, um, you know modifying them, we can we can make that even more clear. Okay, thanks. Sure. Perhaps you can. Uh Give us a little information on how these may be uh, mended in the future. It has been a while since uh, the QA PRP had been updated. Yeah, that's correct. We um, so the QA program plan uh, typically has a five-year life cycle. After that, it's reviewed and revised as necessary. Um, over time, what we found was that these uh, more specific uh, guidelines that we have, uh, they aged a lot more quickly. In, in, in other words, they required more frequent review and more uh, potentially more frequent revision than just the big text document. And so to answer Eric's question, we uh, – sort of anticipate a more fluid existence for the tables. Um, they will be under a more um, uh, under more constant review and certainly we'll be looking over time to add um, to either add analytes and parameters to existing categories that we have um, or to add entirely new categories. Uh, but but those additions to the guidelines and those updates to the guidelines 
won't have to wait the five years that's typically associated with the, the overall QA program plan document. 